Welcome, everyone. I'm Cindy Zolnier. I'm the CEO of the Texas Nurses Association, and my camera is malfunctioning, so you're not able to see my face, but I would like to welcome you to this very special um, presentation and opportunity to have a conversation with Senator John Cornyn. Um, he was um, with Congress, passed a very important bill, the CARES Act, which provided significant funding for hospitals and healthcare providers, enabled um, greater telehealth connectivity and access, offered Good Samaritan protections for professionals, and expanded the types of providers who could order home health and DME. These measures greatly affect our ability to provide the health care that our citizens in Texas so much need. So we're very grateful for this and other work that's been happening at Capitol in response to the COVID pandemic. So with that, I would like to um, hand off to um, the Senator. John Cornyn is serving his third year in the U.S. Senate, where he has earned a reputation as an articulate and powerful voice for Texas values in Washington. Senator Cornyn is known for reaching across the aisle to get results as he did recently for the CARES Act. Fellow TNA members, please join me in welcoming our senior United States Senator, John Cornyn. And I will let everyone know that you are, everyone's muted except for the presenters. If you have questions, you can enter them in the question box um, if you join by the, um, the webinar meeting. So with that, thank you for joining us, um, Senator. Well, thank you, Cindy. And uh, to the Texas Nurses Association, um, I appreciate your organizing this call. Uh, first and foremost, let me start with a heartfelt thank you to all of the nurses and healthcare professionals um, who are on the front lines of this uh, of this war against COVID-19, uh, including those who are unable to join us today. We know that under even normal circumstances. Uh, Texas nurses provide life-saving care and support all of our families and friends and neighbors during their toughest days. And the current crisis has only underscored the critical and courageous work you do every day. While the rest of the country is hunkered down at home, you are fighting this virus on the front lines. You're spending time away from your families and making tremendous physical and emotional sacrifices to keep us all safe. So I want to start with that and say I'm incredibly grateful to each of you for the work you're doing, and I appreciate the honor of representing you in the United States Senate. As Cindy said, we've been busy in uh, Washington, D.C., trying to provide the resources and guidance that is applied on the front lines of this fight. As you know, the federal government, uh, the national government, has an important role to play, but we've seen federalism at work in the sense that uh, individual governors have been making decisions, mayors, county judges, based on conditions on the ground with the guidance of people like Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks and other healthcare professionals. In one of my first calls with Governor Abbott, he told me that he was most concerned about two things. One is the absence or limited availability of personal protective equipment and the inadequate supply of testing equipment. Well, we know that it's absolutely critical for our healthcare professionals to maintain their good health. And um, so they should never be forced to decide between their health and that of a patient. So last month in the CARES Act, we included $16 billion for the strategic national stockpile to buy more PPE and other medical supplies. One of the challenges that we found and one of the lessons that we're learning from this virus is the fact that we are dependent on importing a lot of our uh, protective um, equipment and supplies, including medication. And I think that's one of the lessons this virus will teach us. And I think that is uh, going to be uh, something we will have to pay attention to and do something about after this immediate crisis passes. In addition to the $16 billion for additional PPE and other medical supplies, there was a billion dollars for the Defense Production Act to bolster domestic supply chains and speed up production, as well as ventilators and other equipment. While that funding was great news, the real question is, 
when will these products reach the healthcare provider? PPE is being delivered directly to the Department of Emergency Management, which will be distributed throughout the state. And providers can, of course, contact them to make requests in my office. Um, to the extent you'd like to reach out to us, is more than happy to facilitate that communication if you need, if you'd like for us to. Additional health care provisions um, for health care workers. We provided two and a half billion dollars in state and local grants to ensure that health care workers and priority one patients can be tested. We all hear the importance of more, uh, more testing and faster testing. We provided $100 billion for hospitals, the first $30 billion of which has already been released. And we allow nurse practitioners and clinical nurse specialists to order home health services. We've also expanded the availability of telehealth, which of course allows seniors to access a range of services from home, somebody who might be uh, infectious. And it's obviously important to reach out to some of the more rural parts of our state. We know that the healthcare concerns are foremost, but financial concerns go along with those. And with some of the closings, the massive closings of restaurants, bars, um, other uh, hospitality industry, we know there are a lot of folks who are working by the hour who don't have a big savings account that they can fall back on. They may not have any savings account at all. So one of the first things we decided to do financially is to make sure that Texans who make less than $75,000 a year will get a $1,200 check. A family of four could conceivably get up to $3,400, and uh, that's for with a household income of up to $150,000. Those first checks should arrive this week. We've also put a pause on student loan repayments. Now, borrowers can opt in with their servicers to defer payments with no penalty and no interest for six months. Our frontline healthcare providers are the key to overcoming this crisis. And again, I want to emphasize my gratitude to you for what you're doing. And I want to ensure you that I'm here to help any way I can. And I encourage you to contact my office if I can ever be of assistance. Many of you know Jeff Last, who works in my DC office, who handles healthcare policy. And he's joining us on this video conference. And he's a great resource for all of you to utilize as well. So again, thank you to the Texas Nurses Association for making this call possible. And let me turn it back over to Cindy to get us started. Thank you, Senator. Um, we have three nurses on the call who have um, agreed to um, talk a little bit about their situation and share a little bit about their circumstances. First is um, Kimberly Curtin, who is a clinical administrative director at MD Anderson. So she is a nurse in our urban um, area of the state. Kimmy, are you ready? I am. Good afternoon. Thank you, Senator Cornyn, for joining us today and for all of the support that you are, you know, helping provide to our nurses and healthcare workers on the front line, as well as all of the families that are in distress right now. A couple of things that I wanted to share with you that are still of some concern in our um, state and certainly um, in our healthcare environment is the uh, protective um, equipment that there are PPE equipment that we're still having challenges, um, not only obtaining, but that the concern is that we're having to reuse our PPE, our mask. When we come into the building every day, we're given a mask and a paper bag, and we're told this is your mask for the day, and keep it, you need to take it off, please put it in a paper bag, and that is with you throughout your whole day. Well, you know, we're breathing in those masks, we're sneezing in those masks all day, they become moist and soiled. If they become extremely soiled, we're able to uh, request another one, but ideally they're asking us to reuse our PPE equipment throughout the day. So I, I feel like that isn't um, safe, not only for us, but also for our patients and visitors is still um, somewhat of a concern. The second concern I have is um, our preparation for what we're calling our surge of patients um, with COVID that will have to be hospitalized. I work in an ambulatory care setting where our nurses have not taken care of inpatients. Um, some of them in their career. So they're very concerned about the protection they have, the training and the education that they 
will be provided when and if we have to go into an inpatient environment and care for these extremely ill patients without proper um, you know, training and education, as well as then where would we stand with our PPE equipment. And lastly, I would just really like to um, really be considerate and thoughtful and ask that you advocate to not open up businesses too soon, um, lift social distancing. I feel like there's some buzz around the state about doing that, and I feel we need to take a longer period of time before we open the floodgates, if you will. So those are just some of our concerns in the Houston metropolitan area. We're trying to keep everyone safe and healthy, and we really appreciate your support in allowing us to do so. Thank you, Kimmy. Next, I would like to introduce Drew Riddle. Drew is um, an associate professor at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. He is also a um, CRNA and has an active practice. So welcome, Drew. Uh, hi, Cindy. Thank you so much. Senator, we certainly appreciate your time. Good to see you again. And um, thank you for your leadership um, on behalf of um, nurses, but really of all Texans, certainly. Um, we're all in unprecedented times. Um, as Cindy said, I'm an advanced practice nurse. My specialty is as a certified registered nurse anesthetist. Um, so um, a, a couple things I'd like to share with you that we're seeing from an anesthesia specific perspective. Um, as you know, nurse anesthetists traditionally work in operating rooms, um, labor and delivery suites, et cetera, providing anesthesia services for patients that are undergoing uh, surgical uh, and diagnostic procedures. And um, while we continue to be on the front lines, we are airway experts and we are the ones that are often called to um, intubate patients before they go onto a mechanical ventilator, which we've heard so much about in the news. Um, uh, many of our Texas nurse anesthetists have seen a significant reduction in income and in pay because of the postponement, appropriate postponement of elective procedures. Um, nationally, we estimate there's about 80% or so of nurse anesthetists that have either been completely furloughed or are significantly um, seeing significant reductions in pay. And um, while there's certainly um, uh, opportunities within the CARES Act and the Paycheck, uh, Paycheck Protection Program, um, a lot of us are having some difficulty, quite frankly, navigating those um, uh, those, those programs to um, be able to continue to be present and provide the care necessary for patients as they're coming in uh, with COVID-19. But certainly surgeries are still going on for, for other reasons in the state, um, you know, unrelated to COVID-19. Um, I, I certainly um, iterate what my um, colleague Kimmy said about the, uh, the PPE. We are um, those providers at the forefront in the patient's airway, a high, high risk environment where we're interacting with these patients that are positive. And so the lack of personal protective equipment or the ask to reuse equipment when you are taking care of a positive patient and potentially have to go to the next positive patient is um, it, quite frankly, it's scary. Um, and, and the last thing, Senator, I'd, I'd share with you um, relates to, as you alluded in your opening comments, about the removal of a lot of the restrictions and barriers to practice for nurses of, of um, all ilks, uh, registered nurses and advanced practice nurses. And I think we've seen the results of that already in the state of Texas. And so to the extent that uh, from a policy perspective, you're able to continue to support the removal of any artificial barriers or to practice, uh, for, certainly for nurse anesthetists, our ability um, to not have physician supervision for billing uh, Medicare, which was part of the uh, executive order that came out, was is uh, paramount. And, and keeping those uh, permanent um, would be our ask. So uh, again, thank you for your leadership, sir. And, and um, I would ask, uh, the, the same would come to us if there's something that nurses in Texas can do to support you and, and your office during this time, uh, the, the door's open. Certainly give us a call and let us know as well. Well, keep doing what you're doing, Drew. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Next is Debbie Pena. Debbie is a professor at Victoria College in Victoria, Texas. So she is from a rural community. Welcome, Debbie. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Senator Cornyn, for being here today and having us today. Uh, I am from the rural area, so Victoria County. We do have approximately 92,000 people, which is quite a bit. 
but we have a lot of surrounding counties of Calhoun, Matagorda, DeWitt, Lavaca, Goliad, and Jackson counties, and they often do travel to Victoria for health care. Our current COVID-19 rate is 89 with 50 active cases, 38 have recovered and one death. Our needs are more protect protective, personal protective equipment for our nurses and of course, more testing supplies. I did speak to several nurses yesterday and they stated that they have enough protective equipment right now because they are working in conservation mode. So they are reusing and being extra careful with that. Our local newspaper, the Victoria Advocate, does report that our COVID-19 peak over here may not be reached until late April, early May. So we are concerned that people without symptoms are able to spread the virus. And so we do ask for more testing and um, are just hoping that businesses open slowly in conjunction with our city officials and county leaders. But again, thank you for everything. We do appreciate all that you are doing. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Debbie. Do um, Serena, who is the director of practice at TNA, she is um, moderating the questions. Do we have questions for the senator? We do. Senator Corden, thank you for uh, being here with us today. And we have approximately 360 nurses on the line. The questions are flowing in. Um, one of the I, questions I, is... I had 350 questions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know we don't have time for that, but I. Um, a lot of the questions are very similar. So um, one of the questions is, we have a huge increase in the number of patients who are now on ventilators. The production of drugs to maintain these patients on ventilators has not been increased. Have you heard anything about this? And is there any way that you can help us resolve this issue? Well, I'm, as I mentioned, Jeff Last, who helps me on healthcare issues and uh, is my principal liaison with the FDA and other and health and human services and the like, uh, will certainly look into that. I had not heard about the uh, uh, access to prescription drugs being a, a, a urgent problem. I do know that obviously we're very dependent on importing uh, drugs from other countries and, and shortages are, are a risk, particularly during times of unexpected surges. Uh, but we'll certainly look into, into that and see if there's some way we can possibly help. I think what we've all seen is that this, um, this uh, pandemic kind of hit us uh, flat-footed, and that's not meant to disparage anybody uh, in particular. Uh, it's just a state of fact. This is a new phenomenon, relatively new phenomenon. None of the previous um, previous viruses like SARS or MERS or others kind of created this same sort of sense of, uh, of, of helplessness and uh, really wondering how this will all end. So uh, I think we're learning a lot of lessons, and uh, many of which are going to mean that, like the PPE that we've talked about repeatedly, um, we need to do a better job of producing that here in the United States, and then find a way logistically of getting it to the frontline user uh, faster. Um, there is an incredible capacity coming online, but it's uh, not not on the same timeline as the virus. So obviously, that's something we uh, uh, we continue to work at. Um, I think um, there was just, a, I think Debbie was the one talking about uh, testing and, and that certainly uh, remains very, very important because especially I was looking online, Dr. Gottlieb, the former FDA commissioner who I have great respect for, he said there's a new study that shows that about a large percentage of people are shedding the virus. In other words, are contagious before they even have symptoms themselves. And I'll be interested in reading that and understanding that better. But we just simply need to uh, get this testing like the Abbott quick tests online uh, that I went through when I went to visit the president at the White House about a week and a half ago. Uh, they can get that done in about five or min five minutes or so. But the fact is it's not widely dispersed, even to our urban areas, much less our rural areas like Victoria, 
So we simply, uh, we just have to keep at it and uh, not take no for an answer. And we are doing everything we know how to do, but I appreciate the, the, uh, the input and the uh, focus, um, what, what should be the focus of our efforts. The next question, um, Senator Cornyn, this may be a crazy thought, but N95 masks are similar to air conditioner filters. What types of public private partnerships um, have been put together to repurpose um, those facilities to assist us in, in producing um, additional N95 masks? Well, that's an interesting comment. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but uh, we certainly can look into it. I know there's all sorts of uh, new technology and, and people are uh, are being resourceful and coming up with, with masks uh, that we can actually use in our home, nothing you'd use in a healthcare facility. But I also was talking two days ago to a, a gentleman I know who's seeking FDA approval for an insert into masks, which actually would create an electric field, which is uh, which kills uh, the virus, uh, which is amazing innovation he said it's really not all that sophisticated but it actually literally uses the moisture on your breath and your face to create a electric circuit which will kill the kill the virus so in addition to sort of low-tech ideas like the one you suggested that we'll certainly look into uh, there are i think more tech, more innovative ways that we can uh, help our frontline healthcare providers make sure they can safely perform their their duties And the next question, um, one key to keeping our communities healthy is adequate nutrition. It's been well documented that many of our communities are facing challenges in stocking food banks, particularly for those individuals who've been furloughed or otherwise out of work. Are there any plans to provide support to these food banks so we can ensure uh, our communities have the appropriate nutrition? Absolutely. When one of the first uh, bills we passed uh, made it possible for uh, seniors who to get uh, meals delivered to their to their homes, so they wouldn't be exposed to a uh, uh, to the virus any more than necessary. Knowing that seniors are more vulnerable uh, than uh, than, the, than younger folks, and we also because schools have been closed, kids on uh, free or reduced cost uh, lunches, uh, we've now made it possible for them to do a takeout, um, pick up those meals at a location so they won't miss out on that on that nutrition. I know that one of the, in addition to the money we've already spent for the SNAP program, I know there's under consideration additional resources. Um, and I know from my, my, my own staff who's been volunteering at food banks across the state in my own experience visiting those food banks that there is, even in, even in uh, nor normal times, there's a lot of demand. And particularly now you can imagine with people not getting paid, uh, again, through no fault of their own, we're trying to address that financial part of it. But in the meantime, people need to eat. So I'm very sympathetic to the need to make sure we uh, have uh, adequate nutrition for all of our people. And I'll, I'll keep that as a priority. Great. Um, next question. Um, is I want to thank Senator Cornyn for removing the barrier to allow nurse practitioners and clinical nurse specialists to certify home health. I would ask the Senator to remove regulatory burdens and limitations for advanced practice nurses delivering care to patients covered by Medicare and Medicaid with reimbursement parity and signature authority, for instance, um, to admit and certify for skilled nursing care. That was more of a comment, but um, an important one to make, I think. Well, I think, I think Drew, Drew made that same comment earlier. And uh, I think what we're learning is that uh, with the federal and state government waiving certain regulatory requirements, I think it really it causes us to reflect on wondering, well, why did we have that regulatory limitation in place in the first place? And does it really make sense? So I think you're going to see a lot of re-examination of some of the regulations that we see, not just in the healthcare healthcare field, um, but across the board. And maybe one of the positive outcomes of this, the silver lining, will be uh, uh, unleashing a lot more great nursing talent to provide 
uh, on the front lines, uh, primary care uh, to our uh, uh, and and beyond uh, to, uh, to Texas and, and American uh, patients. So I'll certainly keep that in mind, and and I I will ask that question. And make sure that anytime somebody wants to reinstate one of these regulations, uh, they have a very good reason to do so. And I know we um, we have time for just a few more questions. So the next question is, in my institution, our main issue is lack of competent staff members as they are leaving for higher pay rates in states like New York or Michigan. How can we mandate for disaster pay locally in Texas? Our institution has denied this in only paying base pay for our staff who are caring for COVID positive patients. Well, that's a great that's a great question. Um, sort of hazardous duty pay, um, you know, because uh, because nursing is a something that is transportable. People, I guess, can move to places where they're needed the most. That's very helpful, but obviously, um, it leaves holes and inadequate uh, unmet need behind. And um, let us let us work on that a little bit with you and see if we can come up with something that that makes that makes sense. Um, I would say that there's probably going to be less competition for workforce with the recession that we are in the midst of right now and which will likely continue through the end of at least the second quarter. Uh, but that's a that's a really good point that uh, I'll ask Jeff uh, to help me work with you and come up with some suggestions on how we can address that, particularly during this crisis. Great. And last question for you. Um, Senator Cornyn, um, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, how has this changed your political priorities? Hmm. Well, if you told me uh, two months ago that I would have voted for a $2.2 trillion spending bill uh, that would um, be borrowed money, and uh, if you told me that we would have uh, voted unanimously in the Senate to pass it, I would have, uh, I would not have believed it. But what we've seen is this unprecedented emergency, and it is exactly that. And it's in times of uh, great national and international emergencies that uh, really, I think, test us all as individuals and as professionals. And the question is, are we going to pass that test? Are we gonna to rise to the challenge? And that's why, why it's been so important after 9-11, after the 2008 meltdown of our, our economy, and now that uh, we uh, don't, um, we don't prioritize our politics. Um, we, we prioritize the people we are privileged to represent. And that's what, uh, that's what we're trying to do with uh, the legislation we passed. That's the spirit in which we'll continue to try to address this. Um, my experience in uh, politics has been that often we agree on the result that we want to accomplish, but where we really disagree is on the best means to accomplish it. Um, that is whether government ought to do something or whether it be all left to the private sector or the like. But um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of lessons for me and all of us to learn from this experience um, because we know that uh, we cannot let this happen again. This is a huge vulnerability to our public health and to our economy. And uh, we simply cannot allow this to happen again. That's going to have to that's going to implicate our, our relationship with China and uh, international organizations like the World Health Organization and just some of our some of our uh, manufacturing um, offshoring of manufacturing of critical equipment like PPE and medication that are not then available during a time of a crisis. So I think there's a lot of lessons for us to learn here and they're not uh, not particularly partisan. But uh, we need to figure a way to, 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 to learn from what this virus is trying to teach us and to make sure we do better next time. Thank you, Senator Cornyn. We very much appreciate this opportunity to have this very frank and candid discussion with you and for your willingness, willingness to listen to nurses on the front line um, share their concerns and, and your responsiveness to those concerns. I especially appreciated your statement is we don't prioritize politics, we prioritize the people we represent. 
And I think that's what we're experiencing today. And we thank you. We thank you for um, all that you're doing in Washington to, uh, to fight, to go to war with this pandemic. And, um, and you're taking time out of your, your busy schedule to um, have this conversation with nurses here in Texas. Cindy, can I can I mention one one last thing because there was a, some issues brought up that I just didn't didn't address, but I want I, I'm, I'm this is a very important one, and one that's being discussed a lot now at the state and also the, at the at the national level, and that is how do we come out of this? Uh, and I think um, so far I'm I'm very encouraged by what I'm hearing um, from everybody from the president down to the governor Abbott, down to our mayors and county judges. And what they're saying is we're going to listen to the, uh, to the experts and people who understand how this uh, pandemic uh, got started and how it spread so quickly. I do think it's at some point, maybe it's with the more pervasive testing, maybe with some of the testing that will determine whether you have the antibodies and thus likely immune to this particular virus. A lot of this is going to answer a number of questions. I think there's 70 different clinical trials occurring right now. So uh, again, the experts I listen to, people like Scott Gottlieb, are saying a vaccine is far off, but in the meantime, we're working on cures. And, and before we even get to that, because we know that the uh, clinical trials don't happen in the blink of an eye, uh, we're going to have to continue to change the way we uh, we do business in terms of uh, personal hygiene and in terms of uh, social distancing, and that's going to that's going to change the way we live. Uh, but I think that's one of the things we're going to have to learn from from this experience. Yes. Thank you for letting me add that. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, we will end the web webinar. But um, thank you again um, for what you're doing for us, and um, we will continue to battle this on the front line. My honor. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon, everyone.